you're in for a treat tonight. Um, Scott Ortman is going to be our speaker. He told me that he spent pretty much two decades of his life um, relating uh, either present or uh, working with uh, folks up at Crow Canyon. Uh, master's degree initially here at, at ASU and then came back and completed a, a dissertation. So uh, Scott is one of, I, I would say he's incredibly diverse and creative in his research interests. Um, he's engaged very um, effectively with native communities using very creative approaches to get at um, the past. And he's going to talk to us tonight about uh, transformations in 17th century New Mexico. So I'm looking forward to hearing this. And uh, Scott, it's, it's all yours. Before I get going, I also just want to say thank you for uh, supporting Archaeology Southwest. Uh, Bill's been running uh, the, the uh, organization for several decades now, and it's really one of the important institutions supporting archaeology, not only in the Southwest, but nationwide. Uh, they have a number of terrific programs that uh, uh, help not only preserve the archaeological record, but expand knowledge of it and share the results of what we do with people like you all, including through events like this. So uh, if you're not a member, but you're here tonight, I hope you will consider joining uh, the organization and uh, supporting the work that they do. We're in an era now where all of us need to uh, stick together with the things that we value. And uh, I value archaeology, and if you do too, supporting Archaeology Southwest is one of the ways uh, you can show that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about me before I get into my topic tonight. Um, I first started doing uh, archaeology when I was in college in the year 1990. And 1990 was an important year because it was the year that the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was passed. Uh, we call it NAGPRA today. Uh, you hear the acronym from time to time when things like Kennewick Man comes up. Uh, well, you know, I grew up in the era of NAGPRA, and I remember uh, when uh, I first started going on tours of archaeological sites uh, that were being led by my elders in the field back in 1990. You know, I, I remember going to archaeological sites where the, the archaeologist viewed him or herself as the person who knew what there was to know about uh, the place that we were visiting. Uh, and I remember going on tours where archaeologists would, you know, talk about what archaeologists know, while there were native elders uh, that knew stories about these places, uh, could talk about them in their own language, knew what the words for the things were that were on the ground. Uh, and yet, my elders would give these tours and present what they knew about the past of these sites, pretending like those people weren't even there. In other words, there was no difference between an Anglo from St. Louis that was going to look at an archaeological site for the first time and someone whose entire cultural tradition informed them about the significance of the places we were visiting. And, you know, I would say the primary impact NAGPRA had for people of my generation is to undo that and to say, that's not right. That's not right. Archaeologists certainly have, uh, archaeology has developed a series of techniques through which we can learn interesting things about the past through excavation, survey, quantification, analysis, chemistry, radiocarbon dating, tree ring dating, all that sort of stuff. And it's cool. We can learn a lot of cool stuff about the past from that. But you can learn cool stuff about the past from talking to people who know stories about it too. You can learn cool things about the past from learning about how contemporary descendants of the people that created these sites talk about them, how they describe them themselves, their own view of their history and how it came to be. So I grew up in this era of NAGPRA where you know, I would say the main, perp the main positive impact of the law was to encourage archaeologists and native experts to get to know each other and to talk to each other and to encounter each other on a more level playing field, uh, to learn about the past together and to recognize that 
actually, in the same way that every age has its Rome, you know, every age of Pueblo people has their view of the past too. The past is a resource that we continue to learn from uh, as we move forward. And why not learn about it together? Why not be involved in that process together? That's the way I think about it. That's the way I think about doing archaeology. And it is a product of the, the context in which I came of age in the field. Um, so today, uh, this idea of doing archaeology in a collaborative way, involving uh, Pueblo people in the work that I do directly, being a part of the field teams, uh, having them be involved in defining the questions that we ask, how we go about uh, addressing them, uh, how we talk about them, uh, you know, that stuff goes on. And, and collaborative archaeology is, is the way I like to describe what I, I like to do. And the topic I want to bring up tonight is connected to this, I think, long-term process of um, this long-term process of archaeologists and Native people learning how to work together uh, for mutual benefit of everyone. And the issue I want to describe is, to be honest, it can get kind of touchy. Uh, and I'm still working on how to actually talk about it in a way that is um, productive and doesn't set off any alarms. Uh, and. Uh, I'm not sure that I have it quite right yet, so I also want to just beg your forgiveness for all of the things I may say that can be construed in ways that are uh, negative or offensive, uh, because that's a possibility with the topic I'm about to talk about. So uh, I want to beg your forgiveness before, before I get going. So what I want to talk about is um, the way that archaeologists and historians have typically written about and done research on the initial century of uh, Spanish contact in New Mexico. So the period between roughly 1600, I'm, 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 not, gonna, I'm not gonna worry too much about Coronado per se, but 16, 1598 when the first capital of New Mexico was founded uh, at uh, 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 San Gabriel del Yungue, and 1680 when the most successful native uprising against European colonization in the history of that happened, uh, something called the Pueblo Revolt. Uh, I want to talk about this period between about 1600 and 1680, and the way archaeologists and historians have thought about, written about, and talked about this period of time. And what I would say is that today there's a sort of a dominant narrative that comes out of research by scholars on this period of time, and it runs something like this. Before the Spaniards even got to New Mexico, the infectious diseases that the conquistadors carried with them when they came across the water on the boats preceded them as a wave of illness and death across North America, from Mexico northward into native North America, such that a lot of the population had perished from infectious disease before the first Spaniards even showed up. When the Spaniards did finally arrive, uh, you know, the story goes that they immediately set about oppressing native people, forcing them to uh, give up a lot of their production, you know, their food, their clothing, other things like that, for the Spaniards, for their benefit. Uh, they were forced to uh, work for the Spaniards, uh, to uh, do lots of things that, uh, you know, the way the story goes, people really didn't want to do. Uh, they were forced to convert to Christianity uh, on pain of loss of limb or life. They, their native traditions were violently repressed by the Spanish. There are lots of tales of uh, you know, Pueblo people being, again, maimed, injured, killed for refusing to do the, Spanish, the Spaniards bidding. Uh, but Pueblo people resisted. You know, they fought back against those injustices uh, fomented by the Spaniards. And eventually, uh, they banded together, they revolted, and they drove the oppressors out of New Mexico from Santa Fe all the way to El Paso, Texas, and they were finally free again 
for 16 years, right? Where they experienced this, you know, successful revolt and revitalization of their culture, such that 16 years later when the Spaniards came back, they were chastened a little bit. And when they came back again, they were a little bit kinder and gentler than they had been in the past. Uh, and as a result, Pueblo culture was allowed to persist and is with us to the present day. Now, that's the dominant narrative that is out there in the world of scholarship about what happened in New Mexico uh, in the 17th century. And there's lots of evidence that this is what happened. Okay, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that this is definitely wrong. Uh, many, there's lots of good evidence that this first century was very difficult uh, and lots of bad stuff happened. Uh, there are documents from the Pueblo Revolt period from uh, Pueblo warriors that were captured by the Spanish uh, just on the eve of the revolt or shortly after uh, that describe the you know, in vivid detail how pissed off Pueblo people are about how poorly they're being treated by the Spaniards. Uh, and there are accounts of this, you know, religious revitalization, a millennial messianic type of movement, you know, that was spreading through the Pueblos, that was supporting the rebellion. Uh, the archaeological research about the Pueblo revolt period also shows evidence of Pueblo people uh, revitalizing their culture in response to throwing off the yoke of the Spanish. Uh, so, you know, a lot of this narrative is based in fact. Um, there is a sense in which all of this stuff I've just been describing to you really did happen. Yet there's some interesting things about the realities of Pueblo culture today that are sort of puzzling in light of this narrative. Uh, one of them is that, um, you know, the leader of the Pueblo Revolt was a guy named Pope. And today, there is a statue of Pope uh, in the U.S. Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol. He is the only Native American person to be memorialized through a statue uh, in the U.S. Capitol today. So you might think that because of that, well, Pope is like this central figure in Pueblo oral traditions, and that anthropologists would have been learning about Pope from every Pueblo person they talked to for ever since anthropologists started asking Pueblo people about their traditions. And yet it turns out, if you read the literature, the oral traditions and ethnographic literature of the Pueblo people, Pope is never mentioned once. The person who's supposed to be responsible for the ability of Pueblo people to persevere in the, in the face of Spanish oppression is not mentioned in any oral tradition I have ever read. It is only mentioned in the Spanish documents. So what's going on there? Uh, and so it turns out that this interest in Pope among Pueblo people is actually a relatively recent phenomenon as far as I can tell. Uh, uh, in fact, I know the person who was responsible for uh, the movement to get Pope established as the second famous New Mexican to be in the U.S. Capitol. Uh, his name is Herman Agoyo. He's from Oke Wingate. Uh, you know, it was a, long, it was a decades long struggle for him to get that through, and it happened. You know. And today, Pueblo people talk about the Pueblo Revolt and Pope a lot. You'll see, in fact, there's a there's some cool uh, Tewa cartoonists that make these cool, like, fake magazine, like, uh, superhero uh, comic book covers, you know, showing Pope and episodes from the Pueblo Revolt, depicting him as, like, a superhero, you know, like a Marvel comic guy. Uh, incredible, you know. So today, the Pueblo Revolt is a very important element of Pueblo identity. But it seems like it's a relatively recent thing, as far as I can tell. And then, you know, one of the things I do, since I work a lot with Pueblo people, I hang out with Pueblo people a lot, you know, lots of friends, go to feast days, go to people's homes, hang out, do things, do traditional activities. Well, if you go to a Pueblo feast day today, what you'll see is that the traditional dress of the men and women in the dances is, well, 
the women are wearing a woolen manta made from sheep, uh, she sheep wool that was introduced by Spaniards in the 17th century. The men are wearing cotton shirts that are tailored with buttons. Uh, if you go to a feast day and sit down to have a meal with a Pueblo family, you'll eat wheat bread cooked in an orno. Wheat introduced by the Spaniards. Hmm? And every Pueblo today has a church as well as a kiva. And I've been to several Pueblo weddings where there's the church part and the plaza part. And that's what you do. That's the appropriate way to get married, is to have both. Uh, and on a Pueblo feast day, of course, the feast is for the patron saint of the Pueblo. The, the, the saint is brought out, the santos brought out of the church, prayed it around, put in a beer to watch the community dancing for him or her, uh, to honor that person. It still goes on today. It's not like Pueblo people stopped honoring the patron saint of the village when when New Mexico became part of the United States. They still do it, right? And so if you ask Pueblo people today, well, why do you do all these things? They, they're all Spanish things. Pueblo people will say, well, what do you mean? It's just what we do. It's our tradition. What's the big whoop? But for some reason, it is a big whoop to Anglo scholars that study Pueblo history. For some reason, and this is what I want to talk about, is why that issue exists. Why is it a big deal that just what Pueblo people do seems strange to Anglo scholars? Uh, and the way I like to think about the issue is it's, it's sort of the issue of American Christmas. So it's almost Christmas time. And pretty soon, all of you are going to be going and, well, first of all, even though it's Phoenix, you're going to get out your wool sweaters because it's supposed to snow. <coughs> you're going to go get a Christmas tree, an evergreen, chop it down and put it up in your house. Now, why exactly do we do that? Uh, you're going to decorate it with lights and ornaments. You're going to put uh, stockings over the hearth if you have a fireplace. Or maybe you'll put it in front of your TV with the Yule Log channel showing. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know, put it on maybe in front of your washing machine. I don't know, something that generates heat. Uh, you, you, you know, and all the kids are excited about Santa. Well, wait, so now who is Santa? So Santa is this guy that has this red suit with fur and he, and he has flying reindeer. Where is he from? And he comes home with these little bell, jingling bells, and he can magically fly around and disappear and reappear, and he smokes this pipe, which must have some really cool stuff in it, because look what he can do. <laughs> right? Or you'll get out your manger scene, you know, about the birth of a child somewhere in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. Now, what does that have to do with a, with a tree with lights on it? in your house? So what does it have to do with the guy with the flying reindeer and the sleigh? What does it have to do with those, those stockings you put on your, on, your, on your fireplace or whatever you have? The answer is nothing. Historically, those things have nothing to do with each other. They all come, they're all traditions that have developed around the time of the year when the sun is lowest in the sky and it stops its southward migration and starts coming northward again. Uh, the whole reason we talk about the nativity as being at this time of year was because as Christianity spread through Europe, uh, the Christian, you know, the, the hierarchy of the church said, well, I guess we better set Christmas uh, around the winter solstice because that's going to be the best way to get all those pagans to play along. Oh, and so all these pagans played along. Okay, so now today... We do all this stuff. We say it's a traditional American Christmas. And that's great. This is just normal. This is just what goes on in a normal society. 
normal history of normal people who meet each other, encounter things, come in contact with each other. So of course they fight. Of course there's competition over what you should believe and so forth. Uh, but yet, you know, in the end, the constellation of things that any group of people view as being their tradition is this historical product that has no purity or coherence or anything like that. It just is. And yet, the way scholars write about 17th century New Mexico, they pretend like none of that happens. They pretend that Pueblo people had a thing that you would call Pueblo tradition, the quote, native tradition that was organized, pure, a single thing that made sense. And then the Spaniards showed up and wrecked it, right? And so then all of the new things that Pueblo people discovered through interacting with the Spaniards that became a part of their tradition today become a measure of impact or of acculturation, a measure of loss of something. So think about that. If we applied that same logic to ourselves, what would we say about ourselves? You would have no right to say that there is such a thing as Christmas. And you would have no right to think Christmas is cool because it's not real. It's not really yours. Yet that's what I think Anglo scholars do in framing the Colombian encounter in the, so in the Southwest, in New Mexico, and more broadly across the New World. Now, all this bad stuff did happen. But at the same time, the people that were around at that time did all of a sudden see this new little furry animal that had this interesting f hair that you could shear off and weave and make, and it held dye a little bit better than cotton. And, and actually, when it stopped creating, uh, when that critter stopped producing wool, it actually tasted pretty good too. Or, well, gosh, you know, here's this new seed that you can put in the ground, and you can grow it in the spring, and it's ripe by June. Oh my God, the corn's not ripe until October. Oh my God, we can have two crops. Thank goodness. This is, a, this is, this is huge, right? But somehow adopt, starting to grow wheat and eat wheat is loss in the way Anglo scholars talk about it, right? It's the degradation of the purity of some idea of what Pueblo people used to be or what they were in the Garden of Eden before Anglos came and threw them out. I do think there's an element of that that goes on here. Um, so I find this very troubling, actually, because I feel like archaeologists and historians who write about this period of time tend to set up a way of thinking that holds Native people to a higher standard than the dominant society holds itself about a person's freedom to make decisions about how they want to live, what they want to do, uh, based on the situation they find themselves in. It creates a situation where Pueblo people were not allowed to have a variety of opinions in the past about what was going on. Surely everyone wanted to kick out the Spaniards. Surely the Spaniards were universally awful and evil. And yet, when the Pueblo Revolt happened, there were some Pueblos that aligned with the Spaniards, not with Pope. Why is that exactly? Is that because they were turncoats? Is that because they were, you know, I mean, this, this is the stuff that political arguments is, are made of, right? Well, that's fine. We can argue about our perspective on those people that chose to decide with the Spaniards, but the point is that they did. And in a real society, that's what always happens. Pick your issue, and there's a diversity of opinion about how to respond to it, right? So Western scholars have not been allowing Pueblo society to be a real human society. There are people that were not allowed to have history before 
Spanish contact because, of course, what they were when the Spaniards showed up was some thing that we could say was a thing as opposed to Christmas. And they're not allowed to have history after either because if they do, they become less Pueblo. They become one of, quote, us if they choose to participate in the larger world and take from things, take from it what they think is useful. Right? So this is an issue that, I, that really, actually really bothers me. Uh, and I'm trying to develop a, a project that sort of takes a different perspective on this period of time that tries to get a little bit behind this standard narrative and bring a little bit more humanity, I think, or reality um, to what went on during this period of time. And there's, there's three kinds of questions that I'm looking at that, um, that I think are important that anthropologists have not been talking about. So one is this idea of incorporation. Right? So it's the idea that um, Pueblo people willingly incorporated some aspects of Spanish culture into their own tradition and not others. Well, the question is, why did they incorporate some and not others? What are the factors behind what, pe what people chose to incorporate versus not? Um, and an interesting way to, to learn about this is to actually look at the way Pueblo people named the new stuff that the Spaniards brought in. So, for example, um, there, there, there were words in the Tewa language for certain Spanish introductions that are purely native Tewa words. Tewa is a language, of, a, a Pueblo language spoken in the communities that I work with most closely. So, for example, the Tewa word for wheat is tatang. And in translation, it means grass seed. Ta is grass and tang is seed. Tatang, grass seed, means wheat. It's a native term. It seems to imply that Tewa people, in this case, learned about this plant and said, this is pretty cool. We'll call it this. Let's do it. Let's use it. There's other terms that are mixtures of Spanish and Tewa words. So, for example, the word for a bread oven or an orno is pante. Well, pan is bread, but te is the word for a house or a kiva. So, pante is sort of like the bread kiva. So the place where the bread is transformed or cooked and become finished and final and mature, ready to eat, ripe, right? So there's an example also where there's a Spanish term that is sort of incorporated into a Pueblo way of thinking uh, by combining it with a native Tewa term. And then there are some terms that really are Spanish loan words. For example, the Tewa word for horse is caballo, which comes from Spanish caballo. Uh, now, what's interesting here is that in many other Native American languages, the word for horse is often actually some, translates something like the new dog, <laughs> like, or the big dog, yeah. Because uh, for many Plains people, for example, dogs were the primary uh, beast of burden in, in pre-Spanish times. And so when the Spaniards showed up and they brought these horses and they got free and, and Native people started to use them, they're like, oh, these are, these are bigger dogs, right? So incorporating horses into their culture, just like a Christmas tree, just like the nativity. Uh, but in Pueblo, in Pueblo culture, though, it doesn't seem like the horse was incorporated into their way of life in the same way because it's marked as a Spanish thing in their language. Right? So one of the things I'm trying to do to try to get behind this a little bit is think more not so much about what are, there's a lot of studies in linguistics that look at Spanish loan words in Pueblo languages, but no one has asked, what's the list of new stuff the Spaniards introduced and how did Pueblo people name them? It's a different question and it leads you in a different direction to thinking about the ways in which Pueblo people um, actively incorporated elements of European culture and made it their own. Uh, so is that loss? Well, you know. Uh, I don't know. The second area I'm looking at uh, applying these ideas is in the area of uh, settlement patterns and land use. 
So, you know, Southwest archaeologists have studied uh, where people lived and, uh, on the landscape, where people chose to build their villages, how big they got for a long time. And the general rule of thumb for all of, quote, prehistory or pre-Spanish times is that, well, of course, a good thing to do is to learn about, well, where is the best place to grow corn? Surely, people build their villages in the best place to grow corn or the best place to grow beans, you know, the crops that they depended on, the best place to keep turkeys or whatever. Even today, of course, that makes sense. It's one of the primary things that people do. You live where you can grow your food, especially in an agricultural society. And yet, no archaeologist has ever even asked whether the changes in settlement pattern that happened in 17th century New Mexico were the result of Pueblo people saying, well, now that I have wheat and wool, maybe we should live in a place where it's better to grow wheat and wool, as opposed to a place that's only good for corn. No one's ever even asked, well, gee, is the best place to grow wheat different than the best place to grow corn? Where would they be? Would they be different? Would there be a better place to have a village to optimize you know, agricultural production with this new economy? No one's ever asked, because the dominant narrative doesn't let you ask it, right? You don't want to know the answer to that because you would be talking about the impact or the acculturation of Pueblo people. Well, you know, come on, these are human beings. Would you rather have more or less? Would you rather have more food or less food? Most of the time, people would rather have more. So, you know, I think uh, these are important questions to ask. And so what, what we're doing is working on developing, for the first time, models of where the best places to grow these new crops were you know, so that we can find out. Now, I don't know what the answer will be. It may be that it didn't have much impact at all. Uh, and that's fine. I'll be happy with whatever answer we get. I don't really care what the answer is. The key point is that it's important to at least ask the question. You know, you, you know archaeologists have been talking about Pueblo people choosing where to live based on their understanding of the best way to make a living for 2,000 years, and then all of a sudden, where their settlements are is a function of Spanish oppression and not that process. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, maybe it's some mixture of the two. But what is the mixture? Well, I'm hoping to learn more about that. And the third area is that um, this dominant narrative sets up a situation where you can't imagine why Pueblo people would have adopted any element of Spanish culture into their own tradition, because of course it was evil. And thus, when you find things like, oh, well, Tewa people have created native words for all of these new crops, uh, and they came up with a native word also, for example, for a, an irrigation canal, Cuyo Yia, which is like a Sequia Madre in Tewa, uh, you know, irrigation, new technologies perhaps also. Uh, no one's ever asked whether, well, maybe one of the reasons that Pueblo people incorporated some of these things is because it actually did make their lives better. Maybe it did. It could have. It might not have. I don't know. We'll find out. But it might have. But no one even asked the question. The presumption is that everything must have been awful. And therefore, you have no explanation for why anyone would have supported the Spanish during the Pueblo Revolt. Now, again, I don't mean that Spanish depredations didn't happen. I'm sure they did. But any real society is messy, and it's subject to interpretation by different people from different points of view. So if you think about a real situation and a real society, you have to think about the Spaniards doing things that from a certain vantage point are evil and from another vantage point are helpful. And the same thing with Pueblo people. You have to allow that there were some points of view among Pueblo societies that you're like, you know, that's probably not very helpful for figuring out how to deal with the reality of the world you're in. And then there are some that probably were. We don't, you know, all these things were probably going on in the past, and yet we have, you know, through the documentary record, we have a very slim, a very strong filter, right, that brings down to us, you know, their own statements about their own point of view. So... Did these things benefit Pueblo people? Well, archaeologists are learning how to measure standards of living through a variety of different things archaeologists can find and count. 
No one's ever actually done that for this and compared it, say, the 17th century to the 16th and 15th and 14th to say, what actually was the economic impact of the Spanish arrival for the standard of living of Pueblo people? No one's ever done it. Um, it can be done. Again, I just feel that the, the narrative is keeping us from even asking the question. Here again, I don't care what the answer is. It could be that on, on balance, Spanish colonization was bad for Pueblo people. It could be. It could also be that in some ways it helped and in other ways it hurt, right? On balance, it was negative, or on balance, it might have been more positive than we might imagine. Uh, but the key is, is that those are good questions to ask and to investigate because the reality of Pueblo tradition today tells us that it can't, the traditional narrative, the, the dominant narrative cannot be true. Otherwise, there's no way to explain why Pueblo people would have all of these native terms for the new stuff, why they would have incorporated them into their tradition, why they would have Christmas just like we do. There's no explanation based on the current narrative that we have. Uh, so, you know, in, in summary, I, I, you know, this, this way that um, Anglo archaeologists and historians talk about Spanish colonization has been bothering me for a while. And, you know, in some ways, what I feel like is that real colonialism is not allowing Pueblo ancestors to have been real people and not allowing native communities today to be real societies where people can choose for themselves what they want to be without being concerned over whether they will still be real. Whether people from outside communities will say, you're not a real Indian anymore because you make money. I don't think that's fair. I think, you know, I think if you think about the values that make our country what it is, it should be that we let people decide for themselves what they think is best. And, you know, we have lots of immigrant communities in our, in our society today that if you want to keep to your traditions, that's great, that's up to you, that's America. Um, or if you want to change and, and uh, adopt some aspects of American culture into your own, that's great too. Uh, for some reason, I feel like we don't let Native people do that the, by the way we talk about them. And I would like for that to change. Um, I think we need to stop holding Native people and, and Pueblo ancestors to a higher standard of cultural purity than many of us hold ourselves in thinking about our own traditions. And uh, I think, you know, you know, I experience this issue a lot because you know, Tewa villages today have very different histories of engagement with the larger world. Some have been much more engaged than others. You know, sometimes you'll hear uh, people say that the states are the laboratories of democracy. Well, every Tewa village is a laboratory of how to persist and move ahead in the world as it exists today. And every community has their own, reaches their own conclusion about how to do that. Some choose to, to move forward by being engaged. You know, by, by being a part of the larger world they find themselves in. Uh, and some choose to wall themselves off. People are free to do whatever they want. But, but regardless of those choices, it doesn't mean that you are or are not a Pueblo person or a Tewa person. That choice does not make you more or less of who you believe yourself to be. Um, and so, you know, my, I just feel like the, the typical way historians and archaeologists talk about this period of time, it drives us in certain ways that I think are unhealthy and not very helpful. Uh, and so in the work I'm doing now in this period of time, I'm trying to do things that I hope can try to undo some of this uh, perspective and uh, hopefully lead to something that's a little bit more, uh, again, grounded in reality. Uh, so that's what I'm working on. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have about it. Thanks for listening. Coming from the Northern Plains, uh, what you're saying uh, enlarges upon what I've often thought in my own mind. And number one, two things. Number one, we don't give enough quote unquote credit to European diseases for the subjugation of the aboriginal people. 
they generally re, uh, had them, suffered from them, and died from them before there was much Anglo, for lack of a better term, contact. So that maybe the Aboriginal population was decimated by between anywhere from 35 to 75 percent before there was really good firm Anglo contact. And the other thing is we don't look at native people as being humans. This is what I've got. This is what you're, you have brought in. Hmm, what would I do? I'm going to do that because that makes this easier. You know, mm -hmm. we're all opportunist. We'll take what works for us. But we've never said that the original people had the humanity to make judgments and say, I'll take that because it works. Mm. Thank you for those observations. Interesting. It, your comment sort of reminded me of um, a dialogue that I listened to uh, you know, surrounding the election as, as pollsters were slicing and dicing like the fractions of the population in different categories that voted one way or another. Uh, and you know, in this conversation, there was routine surprise about, well, surely gender would trump, uh, I mean, we need a new word. <laughs> gender would overwhelm or overcome other kinds of affiliations in deciding how people vote. Oh, surely race would do that, you know? And, and what ended up coming up was, well, it seemed, to me, it seemed as though class was actually the strongest predictor in some ways of voting patterns. And what I'm getting at is that I think we often make assumptions when we're dealing with societies of the past about which aspects of affiliation that a person has have the strongest impact on the way they behave and make decisions. Um, and so what the dominant narrative does is it says, ethnic identity or tribal identity uh, over, overwhelms all other types of um, affiliations people might create with each other in deciding how people behave. And uh, again, is it true? It's an empirical question to ask, I guess. And I'm sure there are times in history where that has been the case, but I don't think it's always the case or is intrinsically the case. And so you know, we need to get better at learning how to study that. I think you also have to deal with the people themselves, which is more important, that I'm a tribal member or that I have food on my table. I think food would come first, the way I'm looking at it. And then your tribal affiliation, and then again some of your tribal customs. Navajos and Apaches are known throughout history as picking stuff up that other people left behind and reusing it. Um, I was practical. Who wants to carry a, a matate around? But they would pick one up that came from a cave near their site and they'd use it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's useful to them, even though it's uh, maybe a salado matate, it's being used by an Apache person. Yeah. And I think we forget that too, that uh, something is adopted because it's useful to you whether it's a food or a thing, and maybe it's forced on you like religion, you still choose parts that you're gonna keep and um, parts that you're not. So we're, I think we're leaving out and maybe it is something that Anglos have not dealt with well with dealing with Indian people. I don't think they, from my experience, from what I've seen, I don't think a lot of archeologists talk to Indian people as people not as a representative of some tribe, somebody on a meeting, mm -hmm. but they don't get to know them as people, and that's important too, and it, I don't see it happening a lot, personally. Yeah, thank you for your comment there. That, that also reminds me of an experience I had that informs you know, what I do. I, I, I remember you know, in the early years following the passage of NAGPRA, you know, I, I remember so hearing some of my elders say, we need to do some consultation so we can figure out what the Indians want. You know, uh, so that we can know what to do. And you know, basically the underlying logic there was continue to treat Native people as a tribal unit, as a group. You know, take me to your leader. Uh, determine what it was that, quote, they want, or really what it was is 
Anglos decide for themselves what the Indians, quote, want, so that they can go on their merry way and not actually talk to them as people. Um, and um, I've experienced that a lot, actually. I, I remember another time uh, I was going to give a talk uh, uh, at a university, and uh, one of the students said to me, so I know that you work a lot with, uh, with uh, Native people. Well, I mean, how do you negotiate the, the post-colonial condition in light of you know, all this work, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the hardships that archaeology has foisted upon, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I talk to people and we become friends. You know, it's not, I mean, we hang out, we know each other, we get to know each other, we talk. Not as, not as the State Department, you know, as representatives of our tribes, as people. Um, and I agree with you that if you, if you can get behind the identity politics of this stuff, um, of course identity politics are always there. You know, they've always been there. They've been there in our own history just as much as in Pueblo history and the history of, Spain, of colonization. Um, but there's also been other stuff, you know, not just identity politics, there's been other things. Uh, and so, again, I think archeology span and anthropology have been so fixated on identity politics that we've sort of lost sight of some of the other things that make societies tick. Uh, and so I'm hoping to help work on that. Yeah. Just, just a small point. Uh, colonization is kind of messy, and, and it's true that the Native Americans borrowed a lot of European stuff. Well, it went the other way a little bit, too. Uh, corn, uh, words such as canoe, tomahawk, whatever. So it, it was not just a one-way street. Just a small point. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess we're all, uh, we've all been acculturated. <laughs> You're not a real American, apparently. Hmm. Yeah, question. Uh, do you have a notion at this point as to how the different fashions of naming uh, Spanish introdu introduced mm -hmm. items uh, is related to their importance? Uh, among the Puebloans. Yeah. All I can say at this point is I've looked a little bit at the Tewa language, and my sense is that the, you know, on the one hand, for some kind of practical food items and economic types of items, they seem to be native terms, linguists call it neologisms, so new words in the native language um, are pretty typical. And then there are words for things that are sort of not becoming a part of the Pueblo tradition that tend to be labeled as Spanish. But it's not, but it's not strict. Uh, so for example, um, uh, the word for uh, God in Tewa is Yosi, which is probably Dios. It's probably a loan word from the Spanish. Uh, but then the Tewa for church is Misate, which is the mass kiva, basically, you know, the kiva where they say mass. Uh, you know, so, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't say I have a final answer on it yet. I guess what I'd say is I think that there are patterns and that they're interesting. I'm not sure that I have a simple summary for you yet. Um, but, um, yeah, so. First, I want to thank you for taking this approach and studying the impact of uh, European cultures on Native American cultures as perhaps being a positive thing. Because as you said, so much of it is dominated by negativity. Um, my question is, have you evaluated the impact by the aspect of the Spanish culture, for example, the impact by missions, the impact by ranches, mm -hmm. the impact by forts and soldiers, the impact by Spanish pueblos and plazas. Have you, been, have you separated those parts of the Spanish culture as you study your impacts? Yeah, thank you for the question. That's, that's, that's a good question and a good idea, and, and I haven't done that yet. Um, but um, that sounds like a good thing to do. And so I'll think about how to, you know, and. Uh, you know, again, I, I think I don't want to couch what I'm doing as saying it was either positive or negative. What I'm trying to say is that in any real episode of history, there are positive and negative aspects. And, and I just think that, that 
scholarship has focused on the negative almost to the exclusion of the positive. Um, and, um, and, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, I, I want to make sure that, you know, you all leave with that understanding because I'm, I'm not trying to say that there weren't some very unfortunate things that happened. Um, maybe not too fair and balanced, but balanced. <laughs> Um, your comments about, is it Pepe? Pope. Pope mm -hmm. uh, made me think immediately of Squanto mm -hmm. and his relationship with uh, 1585 colonists on the East mm -hmm. Coast. And Squanto was very helpful to those colonists in, in showing them where to catch fish, what kind of native plants they could eat, because they were desperate. But it's also known that he was quite self-advantage oriented. And so it was, a, it was something that he perceived as a way to get something either out of the culture or you know, somewhat materially. But I wonder if he is not as well known in the lore of his tribal hmm. traditions, hmm. or if he's just more known because the Jamestown people wrote down their relationship hmm. with him. Hmm. It's fascinating, isn't it? The, uh, you know, Thanksgiving is a commemoration of uh, intercultural cooperation, actually. Uh, and it's, it is fascinating that that isn't more central to our present day discourse about the history of that, uh, of that holiday. Um, and of course, you can imagine, I mean, just put yourself back in the time of Squanto. Surely there were some people that felt like he was betraying his people by helping the colonists. And then there were some people that probably felt like he was being a decent soul by doing it. Which one was right? I'm not sure there's an answer to that. You know, I mean, it that's, depends on your vantage on these things today. Um, but the key point is to recognize that there was no one perspective on the things that happened in the past, just as there is no one perspective on what happens today. Um, and that in a real society, there will be a diversity of opinions and perspectives on everything that happens. Uh, so. Okay. Two things about as the uh, Anglos came in from the east on the Atlantic coast and came up from Mexico City. The Papal Bull, 1454 and 1493, had more impact on the subjugation of the native people because it was incorporated with the church as it went north, as opposed to when it came with the Anglos coming of along the Atlantic coast and going west because you had a different theology, you had the Reformation uh, theology a little bit, but that didn't mean that they didn't incorporate some of the thoughts that were in, uh, mm -hmm. incorporated in those two papal bulls, but they much stronger coming from the south as they were coming from the east. And it made a difference on, to a degree on how you treated the aboriginal. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, interesting. interesting uh, I've heard a lot of literature about differences in the character of uh, Anglo versus uh, Latin colonization having to do with the details of Protestantism versus Catholicism. So, uh, yeah, I agree that's part of the story, too. Question I have, did the Pueblos, the various Pueblos before the Spanish showed up, were they fussing with each other or were they fairly peaceful? For example, in Florida and some other places when the Spanish first came in, the local chief, chiefs will often say, why don't you come help us beat up on this tribe that are next to us, which we don't like. And the Spanish would go and help them. Of course, they made her friends of the people they helped and enemies of the people they beat up on. Mm -hmm. did, did anything like that happen here in the Southwest? Not that I know of. Um, there certainly were hostilities between different tribal groups uh, in the Southwest in the past. Um, the historical records are pretty clear that, for example, following the Pueblo Revolt, uh, you know, Comanche raids became a big issue uh, for both Spaniards and Pueblo people, uh, and for Apaches. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the Spaniards, when they first arrived, heard tales of uh, plains groups having recently wiped out certain villages uh, uh, in raids and things like that. So. I know that that kind of stuff was going on. I don't know of any accounts of Span. This could be just because I don't know the literature well enough, um, but 
I don't recall any accounts, at least early on, of Spaniards allying with Pueblo people to uh, so go out onto the plains and kick butt, you know, or something like that. Um, um, let's see. I'm trying to think of any other examples. Well, I understand That's about what comes the plains to folks. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're talking about like Pueblos with each other. Pueblo to Pueblo. They yeah. Very yeah, I mean, certainly the Spanish accounts describe walking up to villages and finding them armed and ready, you know, um, and... Um, one, you know, and every Pueblo had uh, military societies, you know, before Spanish contact, and there certainly is good evidence of the kind of glorification of warriors in rock art that you see in panels in New Mexico that predate Spanish contact. So I'm sure that hostility and warfare was a part of their life. Um, I just don't know of any kind of Pueblo versus Pueblo fighting that was going on at the time the Spaniards arrived. Um, in the same way that, for example, it was going on in Mexico uh, or in Peru uh, when the Spaniards showed up. So. Thank you, Scott, very much. It's an excellent presentation and lots of great questions from all the folks here.